Let's pray before we start. Father, we thank you for the gift of this morning. We thank you for the gift of our gathering online as it is. Even as we believe you, God, for a physical gathering uh, to be started at the earliest, we commit that need into your hands and we pray that you would provide the place for us so that we could start meeting from the first Sunday of April. And uh, Lord, if you would uh, cause it to happen, that we would be able to meet even for worship and prayer, um, Lord, the Friday before that Sunday. So we commit all of this into your hands and especially this morning's message. Uh, Lord, I pray that you would speak through me to the hearts and the minds of your people, that you would bring uh, encouragement, you would bring refreshing uh, and a strengthening by way of this message. Simple as it is, but I pray that you would bless your people, all who are hearing you now, and even those who will hear this message, even after the service, Lord. Be glorified in the name of our Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. How to overcome discouragement. Um, I want to share with you four simple um, but very important uh, helpful things or points. Um, some, some things that I things that I do myself when I go through discouragement. And I'm not, I'm not just merely talking about just having a bad day and then you sleep over it and you wake up and you feel better. I'm really talking about a season of pain a season of great crisis, a season of discouragement, um, which is really pressed hard on your soul. And uh, we thank God for his word. We thank God that we find him uh, in his word. We encounter him in his word. And his word is, is true. And his word is, brings life and light. And um, I, want to, I want us to go over there. The first thing I want to uh, share is that we should acknowledge when we are feeling uh, discouraged. We should acknowledge that we are feeling discouraged. That is very important because being real is an important um, place to be and an important posture for us to be because if we deny, then a point comes where we will not be able to experience um, uh, God experiences truth because we're constantly pursuing uh, a, a, a mode or a posture of denial. We will not find him uh, in that place. And then it would be bottled up and break open in a time and in a place where we would not be able to experience the grace of God in that time and that place. So it is important, beloved, that we acknowledge our feelings and our thoughts when we are discouraged. Authenticity is important, being real is important. And we see that in the scriptures. One of the reasons why people keep going back to the book of Psalms is because of the authenticity of the Psalms. It's real. You know, there are moments of pleasure in worship, in thanksgiving, in praise. And there are so many recordings of David and the other Psalmists who are sharing their pain with God. They are sharing their despair with God. They are sharing even their perplexity and their confusion and their heartbrokenness before God. And that's just such a good posture of being authentic, of being real, of being true. And so the first thing I want to share with anyone right now, on, with all of us, because at some time or the other, we will be facing discouragement, is that be real, beloved. Be authentic. Don't deny what you're feeling and what you are thinking. Because denial, denying the reality, you know, begins to uh, cause us to start working on such kind of thought patterns which are unhealthy. We begin to find justifications. We begin to behave in ways uh, that are dysfunctional. And uh, finally, those things begin to detour us away from God. It doesn't take us closer to God. You know, it's truth. It is being real. It is being honest that keeps us in a place where we are able to draw near to God. But if we begin to deny, somehow, you know, we are not able to find God in that place. We will not be able to find help in that place. And that will keep taking us um, away from God. And so I want to encourage 
um, us to be real and acknowledge our emotions and our feelings and our thoughts with God. So it is helpful if I would just say something fine over here. It's helpful to not talk to yourself, but it's helpful at that time to talk to God, to be aware that he is with us. He's with you. He's with me. And rather than just murmuring to myself, which actually re leads to worrying and an increase in anxiety and despair, it's important that we, we, we be aware that God is in the room, that God is with me, and he wants to hear me. And we begin to speak to him what we're feeling, what we're thinking. And it is so beautiful to experience uh, the loving, tender touch and presence of God yeah, in our times of despair. So the first thing is to acknowledge. Secondly, discouragement is not your enemy. Now, um, you know, one of the things that we learn even about pain is that it is important for us as humans to know where we are hurting because that's the place we need to give attention to. Um, the reason God physically and spiritually, emotionally, psychologically wired us to experience pain is because pain indicates the place that needs attention. And so discouragement is not to be viewed as something that is bad, is not to be viewed as our enemy. Just as fear is not your enemy when you are getting close to the edge of a cliff, when you're about to do something wrong or dangerous, and when your alarm systems go on and you are experiencing fear, that fear is not your enemy. That fear is trying to tell you that move away from this place and don't do that, or don't walk so close to the edge of the cliff. In the same way, discouragement can be a helpful reminder that we are not sufficient in ourselves, but that we need God. Self-sufficiency is a dangerous mindset. It immediately detaches a person from God and puts the person outside of the grace of God. And so, um, my dear brothers and sisters, you know, discouragement breaks us. And um, it, it, it is a place where we can experience a, our, our absolute need for God. And so, look at Psalm 34, verse 18 to 19. This is such a beautiful, comforting verse. And may this verse comfort uh, you right now. Psalm 34 verse 18 to 19 says, the Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. The afflictions of the righteous are many, but the Lord rescues him from them all. You know, the Lord is everywhere. We absolutely believe in the omnipresence of God. But in a special way, you know, when we, when we read and study the word, we become aware that there are certain places and to certain people in certain situations that God makes his presence more real and more tangible. We see that. We look at how, you know, God, you know, manifests his presence and power. But look at this. This, this is a verse that helps us understand who experienced the nearness of God. There are these people who are brokenhearted and who are crushed in spirit and who experience the nearness of God. You know, being vulnerable before God, you know, coming to him in our discouragement, coming to him in our pain, coming to him in acknowledging our helplessness in ourselves, even helplessness in terms of the limitations of people around us, you know, is a good thing because it's in that place you and I will experience the help of God, the nearness of the Lord. What would you and me prefer to have? Merely the nearness of men or the nearness of God? Obviously, the nearness of God. And so don't view discouragement as your enemy, but rather Come to him in your pain and discouragement and be aware that he's near to you. 
and that he wants to help you, that he wants to comfort you, strengthen you, make a way for you, and, uh, and that you will have the joy of finding God in your pain as many of the saints in the Bible did. We know that David did. We know that he begins the Psalms with pain, but he ends the Psalms with joy most of the times. You know, we, we see other men and women in the Bible who cried out to God in their despair, who cried out to God in their afflictions, and, and God heard them, and God rescued them, and God delivered them, and God blessed them, and God strengthened them. May that be true, our story. Look at Isaiah 42, verse 3. A bent reed he will not break off, and a dimly burning wick he will not extinguish. He will faithfully bring forth justice. You know, this, this, this verse is a verse of such tenderness. You know, the Lord will hold you so tenderly, so gently, that it says of the Messiah here, prophesied by Isaiah, a bent reed he will not break off, and a dimly burning wick he will not extinguish, but rather he will, he will encourage you to come back into flame. And so if you feel like a, like a bent reed right now, you're saying, God, this has been too heavy on me. Or you're just feeling so, uh, so let down that you feel your, your passion for God and your excitement for the things of God have grown so dim down. You know, God is able to fan it back to flame, beloved. As you understand that God wants to meet you in the place and in the season of your discouragement. And so be encouraged, my brother and sister. Discouragement is not your enemy. You know, one of my favorite verses is in, is in the Psalms, where David says that, do not rejoice over me, enemy, for I will yet rise up. Do not rejoice over me, enemy. And so there are times I've told that to the enemy, and I've told that to myself, you know. Let not the enemy rejoice over me. I will rise up. I will not die but I will live to declare the goodness and the glory of God. So be encouraged, my brother and sister. <clears throat> Discouragement is not your enemy. God wants to meet you there. Thirdly, so the first thing I mentioned was acknowledge your discouragement. The second thing I mentioned is to help us see discouragement not as our enemy, but as a place and opportunity for God uh, to meet with us in that place. Number three, important, pray. Some of the most significant prayers or praying happens in times of discouragement. You know, somehow, you know, God is able to do massive, mighty things in his church when his church goes through testing times, when his church goes through persecution, you know, somehow, historically, when you read church history, you find the church doesn't do well in good times. The church doesn't seem to, you know, be able to maximize the grace of God, you know, in fair weather, in good weather. The church begins to appropriate more of the grace of God and grow in the things of God, grow in faith, in, in purity, in holiness, in prayer, you know, in times of discouragement. And, 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 you know, we see some of the most significant prayers and some of the most powerful encounters that men and women had, as recorded in the Bible, were in times of their pain, in times of their despair and, and discouragement. You know? For example, you know, one of my favorite um, stories, I use the word story in a, in a very factual, true sense, not, myth, not as a myth, but as a fact, and, you know, is the story of, of Samuel's mother, Hannah. You know, she went through such pain and discouragement because of being barren. And uh, when she finally went to Shiloh and went before the tabernacle of the Lord, in the pain of her heart, in the anguish of her heart, when she prayed, you know, she prayed a prayer that she would have surely not prayed 
if she was not in that place of pain. You know, pain makes us pray prayers that we would not pray otherwise. And those prayers usher in the kingdom of God and the glory of God. You must understand that, beloved. And so is, this is closely connected to the point I mentioned earlier, the discouragement is not your enemy. And so significant praying happens, you know, at that time. You know, what did she pray? She actually prayed this. She said, God, if you give me a son, because she was barren. She said, she said something that I have not heard uh, a mother pray uh, to the extent that she meant it. She said, God, I'll give him back to you. I'll give him back to you completely. And that prayer changed not only her life, but the destiny of his life. Because it was the prophet Samuel that would be born through her. And she kept her vow. Three years after the child was born, after she had weaned him, she brought him to Shiloh to the tabernacle and actually gave him to the high priest Eli as she had prayed and made her vow. You know, that's powerful. You know, we can read in the book of 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel how God used Samuel to prepare Israel, to regather Israel back to him because Israel was backslidden. And it was going through terrible, um, a terrible time spiritually and economically and militarily. Its, its borders were affected. It was a broken down nation. And uh, God used Samuel to bring Israel back to him and to prepare the way for the Davidic kingdom, which ultimately would usher in uh, the kingdom of God through the coming of the Messiah uh, in the hundreds of years ahead to come. But what we see was that it was this prayer, a prayer of a desperate prayer of a mother, you know, in a place uh, where she didn't know who to turn to. She turned to God and quietly, you know, in fact, it says she, she couldn't, she was not even uttering her prayer loudly, but she prayed in desperation, God, if you give me a son, I'll give him back to you. You know, in desperate times, we're not to do desperate things. We're supposed to make desperate prayers. Don't do crazy, foolish things in times of discouragement. Do what the saints did as recorded in the Bible. They sought God. You know, we look at the, the uh, story of Elijah, you know, in First Kings. And we see Elijah was, you know, such a powerful prophet of God. But why we say that he was a powerful prophet is because of the way God used him. But interestingly, in the book of James, chapter uh, 5, we see, you know, James writing for us about Elijah, something very interesting and encouraging. He says, James chapter 5, verse 17, Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. Now that's comforting. It's like the Lord telling Shannon, Shannon, you know what? Elijah was like you. You know, I'll be like, really? But the, but the game changer, if I may use that phrase, it says in that same verse 17 continuation, it says, and he prayed earnestly. And we know what happened. But Elijah was a man who was vulnerable to discouragement. You know, after he had killed the prophets of Baal, after a powerful encounter at Mount Carmel, he was the man who saw fire come down from heaven and consume a sacrifice that he had prepared for God in competition to uh, the initial sacrifice that the prophets of Baal had done. It was a competition. Whose God will answer by fire? Will it be the false God of Baal or will it be the God of Israel, the true and the living God who created the universe? And we obviously know the outcome the prophets of Baal, as they cried out to their God, uh, there was no answer. But when Elijah cried out, you know, fire came down from him. The Lord answered by fire and consumed the sacrifice. You know, as a result of that, there was a mighty revival. The people, you know, put to death the false prophets of Baal. But as a result of that, the ungodly, wicked Queen Jezebel, you know, spoke out a threat, telling Elijah, sending a message to him, 
that by tomorrow at this time, I will kill you. Now that man, now that's the, that's the whole thing about a Jezebelic spirit, you know. You know, when she let out that, uh, that threat, he got so, so fearful and so discouraged. And he ran away from that place. And he comes to a place where he's feeling alone. He's discouraged. And, uh, uh, you know, in, in chapter 19 of First Kings, um, he sits down under a tree. And he actually requests the Lord, I want to die. This is just a couple of days before, after, not before, I'm sorry, uh, after this powerful encounter at Mount Carmel where he sees God answer by fire. A couple of days later, he's so discouraged. He's so broken down. And uh, I've seen that happen to myself, you know, just some time back, I experienced the grace of God. I saw the power of God. I seen the, you know, the favor of God. And then a couple of days later, something happens. And I feel so, so down and so out and so discouraged. But from verse um, five, we see right up to <coughs> verse um, 15, you know, or till verse 18, actually. From verse five to verse 18, we don't have time to go through every verse. But we see how God reaches out to Elijah. And I'm talking about praying, beloved. He, what the good thing that Elijah did was that in his despair, even to the point of death, he turned to God. He spoke to God. He prayed to God. And God reached out to him so lovingly and tenderly. He actually fed him a couple of times. He allowed him to sleep. You know, then when he woke up, he actually clarified to him that you're not alone. There are 7,000 prophets apart from you who have not bowed down and compromised to Baal, the false god. He gives them a plan of action. Elijah, I want you to go from here. Go to this place. I want you to anoint these three men who will take on Jezebel. And, and look at the way God lovingly reaches out. So God allowed him to rest physically. God fed him food a couple of times. God gave him a plan of action. And, and, in, and in doing so, he affirmed that Elijah, I'm not counting you out. You're still in this game. You're still in my plan. And I'm going to use you and complete the work that I had put forth and set forth for you. And so, beloved, um, I believe that we can have these kind of encounters with God in the times of discouragement if we pray. And so I want to encourage you that even if you're getting discouraged you know, um, and you're feeling lonely and you're feeling down and out, pray, beloved. You know, just reach out to God. Speak your heart out to him. Pour out your heart. You will experience the tenderness of God. You will experience the strength of God. And may you and I have such God-like encounters that will not only change our lives, but usher in the kingdom of God in an unprecedented way uh, in and through our lives for his glory. Amen. So acknowledge when you're going through discouragement. Don't see discouragement as your enemy, but as your place or season of opportunity to find God in that place. Number three, pray, turn to God. Number four, stay in the midst of community. You know, it's dangerous to be alone. I repeat, it's dangerous to be alone for too long. And uh, I think there's a place for being alone when you are seeking God and seeking refreshment and renewal and rest in him but to keep yourself isolated uh, is for too long is unhealthy and can even be dangerous and we need friends beloved and so we look at the entire bible we see one of the things for example in that same story of a elijah that god sent him back to key people god sent him to anoint uh, the right people to continue the work after him. He even, in fact, restored him back to his school of prophets. And we see how Elisha then began to follow him. And so what I mean to say is that it is very important for us to find, uh, and, I'm, and I'm, let me clarify this, I'm not just even meaning Sunday service and life group. I think that's important. So I'm not um, uh, putting that in lesser value. It is so important for us to be connected on Sunday service so important to be able to be connected in our life groups, but also uh, in that context to be connected to godly friends. 
you know i'm i'm open to uh acknowledging that sometimes what a powerful message to shannon cannot do uh, a kind word or a loving arm of a friend uh, a godly friend around you can do greater greater can bring greater grace on your life and i've experienced that in my own life where you know friends are coming and encouraging us and uh, you know giving us guidance giving us actual real uh, help and support not just in word but really saying that um uh that hey you know we will walk you walk with you through this thing through the season of your life and i also want i also want to say this that friendship is important because many times our discouragement may be due to a wrong understanding that we have a wrong perception and so uh, you know a couple of godly friends coming around or you know and helping readjust our perception would help us just move from discouragement to encouragement in just a matter of an hour or a couple of hours so you know being in the midst of godly friends being connected to godly friends having godly friends is important so important for us to develop friendships beloved um yeah i want to say this to you as an encouragement beloved if you don't have friends you know you know i need to ask yourself as to have you put in sincere effort in having such friends you know have you been a person who's out there you know keeping in touch with people calling making an effort to go and meet you know one of the things that i feel sad is there are people who inflict upon themselves you know being lonely being alone you don't have to be alone if you pray and if you reach out you can get good friends and godly friends and uh, the the danger is also this the absence of godly friends ungodly friends will come and i think i should be talking about that in some time where um don't ever misunderstand the biblical command to love one another means to love and associate with everyone you love everyone but you don't allow everyone to give you a place of uh, a place in your life of influence and authority uh to uh you know take you in the wrong direction you are not obligated to be associated to unhealthy wrong people if you do that intentionally it will cost you and your life will unfortunately bear that kind of a wrong fruit but be in touch with godly people loving godly friends who will encourage you build you up guide you correct you when you need to and give you actual uh, real time help and support so stay in community beloved uh, i want to encourage you to do so so here were four things that i just a uh, sense to share with you about how to overcome discouragement the first acknowledge your discouragement be real be in touch with your emotions and your feelings don't be in denial because if somebody begins to deny what they're feeling and thinking you begin to get wrong thought patterns of falsely justifying and falsely excusing yourself and that will lead to a dysfunctional kind of a behavior that will detour you away from god secondly discouragement is not your enemy it can be a place an opportunity for you to find the lord to experience his tender loving care his encouragement his presence for the lord is near to the broken hearted thirdly pray some of the most significant praying can happen in times of discouragement amen amen for example we see about we saw about hana or about elijah you know god can really usher in his kingdom in an unprecedented way when we turn to him in prayer and so may you find god in your times of discouragement as you turn to him by his grace fourthly don't be alone for too long stay in community have godly friends be connected to the sunday services and the live groups as most of you are doing well in that but uh, be in the midst of godly friends who will lead you and walk alongside with you you know to take you closer to god amen so be encouraged beloved god is with you he's for you he's not against you he gave his only son to die for our sins so that we would have the gift of eternal life the gift of sonship and uh, we would have a hope that is unshakable and no one can take and nothing can take away from us let me pray with you right now father we thank you for this precious uh morning and uh, this word a simple word of encouragement that has come i pray the lord 
you would encourage your children right now. You would minister to them right now by your spirit, by your word, that those who are right now feeling discouraged and really at the bottom would experience your loving arms around him, around her. They would experience your presence right now. They would experience your peace and your strength in their inner man, oh God. Lord, I pray that this would be a week of rest and renewal, even as Elijah experienced that, God, just a resting in you, a re renewal in you, a strengthening in you. I pray that it would be so for every brother and sister of mine who's discouraged right now. Bless them, oh God. And may, Lord, you do powerful things in their life and encounter them. And I pray that, Lord, you would enable us to turn to you, uh, God, and find you in that place of discouragement, in, our, in that place of our pain. For you care for us, for you are near to the brokenhearted and to those who are crushed in spirit. Thank you, Lord, for this uh, precious time. Pray your blessing over every family, God. Help us, God, to once again gather again physically in our life groups, in our Sunday services, we come with this need into your hands. Lord, make a way for us, provide for us. Do what only you can do, God. We are your people, we're your children. You are our Abba Father, our Good Shepherd. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Even so, Lord Jesus, come quickly, for your coming is nearer than ever before, God. Be glorified, Lord. In the name of our Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen. May the Lord bless you. Take care. We'll be in touch.